Boss says if you're one minute late I'm docking 15 minutes from your time gets mad when I don't work the 15 minutes I was docked for free. Posted this in another sub and got told to try it here too. This happened about 4 years ago. I do construction and we start fairly early. Boss got tired of people walking in at 6.05 or 6.03 when we start at 6.00 even though he was a few minutes late more consistently than any one of us were, so he said if you aren't standing in front of me at 6 o'clock when we start then I'm docking 15 minutes from your time for the day. The next day I accidentally forgot my tape measure in my car and had to walk back across the job site to grab it, made it inside at 6.00. Boss chewed me out and told me he was serious yesterday and docked me 15 minutes. So I took all my tools off right there and sat down on a bucket. He asked why I wasn't getting to work and I said I'm not getting paid until 6.15 so I'm not doing any work until 6.15. I enjoy what I do but I don't do it for free. He tried to argue with me about it until I said if you're telling me to work without paying me then that's against the law. You really want to open the company and yourself up to that kind of risk? Maybe I'm the kind to sue. Maybe I'm not. But if you keep on telling me to work after you docked my time then we're gonna find out one way or the other. He shut up pretty quickly after that and everyone else saw me do it and him cave, so now they weren't gonna take his crap either. Over the next few days guys that would have been one or two minutes late just texted the boss hey, sorry boss, would have been there at 6.02 and gotten docked, so I'll see you at 6.15 and I'll get to work then. And then sat in their cars until 6.15 and came in when their time started. So between people doing what I did or just staying in their cars instead. He lost a ton of productivity and morale because he decided that losing 15 minutes of productivity per person and feeling like a big man was better than losing literally 1 or 2 minutes of productivity. Even though everyone stands around BSing and getting material together for the day until about 6 then anyway. After a few weeks of that he got chewed out by his boss over the loss of productivity and how bad the docked timesheets were looking and reflecting poorly on him as a leader because we were missing deadlines over it and it showed that he doesn't know how to manage his people. And then suddenly his little self-implemented policy was gone and we all worked like we were supposed to and caught back up fairly quickly. Worker solidarity for the win. Not one person took his crap and worked the time for free after he tried to swing his weight around on them. But obviously I was a target after that and only made it two more months before he had stacked up enough BS reasons to get away with firing me when I called in a few days in a row after my mom fell and I took off work to take care of her and monitor her for a while during the day. TLDR boss told me because I was one minute late he was taking 15 minutes off of my time, so I didn't work for 15 minutes. People saw me and I accidentally triggered a wave of malicious compliance and my coworkers and the boss got chewed out over it. Colleague thinks she's the big boss but actual boss said no overtime no matter what. Added it to remove abbreviations this happened a few years ago. I was working for a company doing special projects that had to do with building certain products. One Friday evening I get a call from the CFO this guy never called me. Before I didn't even know he had my number who liked playing at project management sometimes. He tells me there has been a huge fuck up in a project. I asked him if it was a project I was involved in. No no it had nothing to do with me and they desperately needed people to come in on Saturday and Sunday and work because this project needs to be delivered to the customer on Monday morning and would I be able to go? I say sure in this company any work on Saturday. Sunday was overtime from the first minute and the overtime rate was very good. He told me I would be joined by 5 of my colleagues almost all of them a delight to work with and one more person that is also a colleague but has all the information regarding this project. So she would lead it and tell us what's needed to be done let's call her genius boss lady or genius in short. Everybody working on this project has at least 3 years experience in the company, some have more than 10 so there wasn't any need for a babysitter, this fact matters for the rest of the story. Saturday morning rolls around and I get to location. We all meet and have some coffee and homemade cookies that my wife made for us. Genius comes in, asks us to gather around and explains that this project was done wrong from the get-go. The company spent hundreds of man hours on it and it was all done wrong and we five have to in two days work not only disassemble everything that was done but redo it from scratch in the correct manner, which not only involved putting it back together but also refabricating parts that were done wrong. Then she goes on to say in these exact words I'm the boss, you do what I say. I have all the schematics in my head if you don't know something ask me and I'll tell you how to do it. We all look at each other with a puzzled look but just shrug our shoulders. Then she quickly and I mean quickly lay down some rules that she wants us to follow. Stupid things that just interfere with our jobs but no one actually caught all of them. So we start working. Like I said we are all experienced. We work in another facility that the company owns and were brought especially to fix this facility's fuck up. All through the job genius does nothing except get in our way, asking stupid questions, drinking coffee, taking smoking breaks, 
treating people badly and making up stupid rules as she goes. At some point the CFO comes in and starts talking to me and in the conversation he says these words no matter what, no one works. Over time no more than 12 hours a day no matter what because it's a Saturday the rules allows us to work up to 12 hours but more than that and the company can get fined. Genius promises the CFO that the job will be done no matter what within those two days of 12 hours. Saturday's work is done after 12 hours we all say goodbye and leave coming back the next day. We get to work again with her making the atmosphere worse and worse by the minute, not trusting us when we say we're gonna do something, hovering over us and generally being a nuisance. As the day goes we can see that we are not going to make it on time, we try to tell her that but she is adamant that this will be done on time, I try to explain to her a few times that seeing how much work there is in her insisting we do not use automated tools it's not possible to finish this in the 5 or 6 hours we have left. There was a lot more shit that she pulled but I won't name all of it to save time on. This already long story and maybe try to keep a bit of anonymity just in case someone recognizes this story. She won't hear it. She says the job will be done. I'm like whatever dude I'm just gonna do what I can since you won't listen. One hour before end of day comes around. We have all been working for 11 hours genius finally realizes this isn't going to work. She calls a real project manager her friend and starts talking to him. I hear her talking on the phone and she is blaming us for not working fast enough or whatever and tells him she promised the CFO to have this done I'm assuming she was betting on riding this success into a promotion or something and she doesn't know what to do. Then she walks out of the building and continues talking out of earshot. After a few minutes of conversation she comes back in all guns blazing telling us to round up again so she can talk to us. With fire in her eyes she goes okay, you points at a guy don't leave until this points. At one part of the project isn't done. You points at me don't leave until that another part is done, and continues doing this until she counted off everybody and then she walks off, I'm assuming for a coffee or a smoke break or whatever. Cue malicious compliance exactly 12 hours after arriving we all put down our tools and start heading out the door. She is shocked asking us where are you going? We all say we're going home, we have been here for 12 hours. She says I told you that none of you leave until your parts are finished. Tested to which we reply no more than 12 hours no matter what and we leave. Later on I found out that she stayed by herself until 0400 in the morning to finish it all by herself. She couldn't do it and had to go home as well, her project manager. Friend came in on morning to help her finish the job. The project was late. Customer came in to pick it up and wasn't happy to see it still not packaged and ready to go. Just as a side note with the exception of genius, for known each of the people working on this project for a few years, all of them would have gladly stayed longer to help finish the project, they have done so many times in the past when called upon if she didn't treat us so badly, we made sure to make management aware of this and she was never given another opportunity to manage anything. Don't care about people calling me on your old number? I'll sort it. This was about 10 years ago, also English is my second language and I'm writing this on my phone, DLDR at the end. Yada yada. I had just moved to Australia and gotten a new phone, but as it turns out my number was someone else's old number. Every other week I'd get calls by a tradie who wanted to know why I wasn't on site, mate, or what I wanted done with building project ABC. Every time I explained at length that they got the wrong number and quite often folks on the other end were absolute rude or thought I was taking the piss and insist I answered their questions or show up on site. Now, I was over it. So I googled my own number and did some digging and eventually found out the guy who had my number before, then his new number and then I called him. I politely explained my dilemma, pointed out that there were two websites still having his old my now new number and if he could please change this and let his contacts know about his new number and to delete the old one as it was getting quite tedious for me. By that time I had used my number for work, visa applications and landlords and friends and changing it would have been a huge pain. I explained all of that, well. Of course he was just as pleasant as most of his contacts and told me something along the lines of I don't give a fuck, mate, that's not my fucking problem, get fucked, sort your own shot out, mate. Well, the universe provides and so I got a great opportunity to do just that only a few weeks later. I received a call in the early hours of one morning by another disgruntled guy telling me he was early and demanding to know where I wanted the sand put down and how to get in. I asked what sand and was told he had a full truckload of sand as ordered and no one was on site and it was all fenced off. Very briefly did I think about launching into my explanation but I was tired and over it and then realized the opportunity provided. I snapped back at him with no uncertainty mate, it's all good, dump it all right in the driveway front of the fence, we'll sort it out when we get there the guy said you sure mate, it's a lot of sand, me absolutely sure mate, thanks a lot I'm alright then boss and hangs up, well, I go back to bed, 
snoozing for another hour with a big smile until my phone rings again and I see it's old mate with his new number who I had saved when I called him a few weeks ago. I pick up rather chipper and he doesn't waste any time launching into a series of swear words and how he has no access to the site and that he has to move a literal ton of sand by hand and whether or not I told the sand guy to dump it all there. I replied you told me to sort this out myself. This is me sorting this out. You can remove the numbers and let your contacts know or not. Totally up to you, mate. He was fuming, called me a few more choice words, promising to find me and a lot more before we ended the conversation. However the numbers disappeared from the internet really quickly after that and I never got another call again. I still have my number and every time I see a truck with sand I chuckle to myself thinking of this guy moving a ton of sand by hand and losing a fair few hours of labor because he was a douchebag and couldn't be bothered sending a few texts. TLDR got someone's old number, tried to ask them to let his contacts know and was cussed out and told to sort it myself. Guy ends up shoveling a ton of sand by hand and losing at least a half day of labor. Don't wanna give me a COVID test? Fine, you can pay me to drive around looking for one. This happened back in the middle of the pandemic. I was working in a food factory at the time. I was sitting in my car during my break when my sister messaged me to let me know she had tested positive. I had been with her just two days before this was not during a lockdown, so I knew I needed to do a test. I didn't want to go back inside knowing I could spread it, so I messaged my manager on Facebook telling him what happened. He messaged me back and told me to meet him outside the front door. He came and met me, and told me hang on while he went to the main office and got me a test. When he came back, he told me they had limited supply and they didn't want to run out. He was as baffled as I was, it was beyond his control. He told me I'd have to pop to the chemist for one they were free. Fine, whatever, if it gets me out of work for a little while. I drove to the nearest chemist a mile up the road to discover it was closed, then it hit me that it was a bank holiday. I checked online trying to find a chemist that was open. There were a few advertised as open but they were closed when I went to them. As a last resort I asked on the family chat if anyone had any tests. My dad replied and said yes, and that my younger brother is at home. By the time I drove to my dad's house, took the test, waited for the result negative and drove back to work it had been an hour and a half, I was clocked in so they had to pay me an hour and a half's wages to drive around. My manager was pissed until I reminded him it was a bank holiday, and it was lucky that my dad had tests or I couldn't have gone back to work that day, we were understaffed that day too. DLDR, employer wouldn't give me a COVID test, so I got to disappear for a while. Drop everything and help you out? Sure, I got you. I want to start this post by saying yes, I know I should have gotten fired for this, and I do not recommend doing this in any service industry job. This happened several years ago while I was working as a waitress at a chain restaurant. There was this insane manager whom I had to work with on several occasions. She was young and thought she knew everything was quite trashy, and was sleeping with one of the higher-ups, who was married, whose wife also worked at the same restaurant, but that's a different story. This manager let's call her Mindy was always on my ass about everything. I was one of the few shift lead servers who knew what they were doing, knew how to make the restaurant money, and had many customers write great reviews and say wonderful things about me. I knew how to do my job and I knew how to do it well. Mindy always singled me out for things when things weren't even my fault. I would always just take it because it wasn't worth my energy fighting about it. She was the only person in the whole restaurant that I did not get along with. I had a great rapport with the bartenders, servers, cooks, back of house staff, and other managers. One day I came in to start my shift but was quickly pulled into the manager's office by a different manager. He wanted to bring it to my attention that Mindy had stated on my past shift that I was on my phone and not working hard. This was not true. I never carried my phone on me because it was a distraction. I didn't have room in my apron, my jeans did not have pockets, and, honestly, I didn't want to have it on me. I mentioned this to the manager, and he gave me the benefit of the doubt but said he was going to keep an eye on me, as cell phone use had been becoming a major problem with several of the servers and bartenders in the past few months. One shift a few days after that was busy. I had a full section and was sat with a party of 12 who all ordered beverages from the bar with water. I grab a tray, fill up the water, and hand the glassware to the service bar in the kitchen area. Once all the drinks were on the tray. I slowly started to lift it to get it situated, as it was heavy. Mindy decided this was the best time to yell at me and tell me she needed me to run the food that was up at the expo line where she was standing and expediting the food. I took a second to look over at two other servers who were leaning against the wall, much closer to her, on their phones. I said, I'm a little busy, can someone else help? She snapped back at me and said, I told you to do it, so you need to do it now. At that moment, I honestly didn't even care anymore. So, I looked her dead in the eyes smiled, said okay and literally dropped the tray of drinks I was holding on the ground, walked over the broken glass, crushing the cups under my feet, 
grabbed the plates of food, and asked her where they were going while keeping the smile on. The look of horror on her face, the phone dwelling server's faces, and the cook's faces were quite priceless. Once I delivered the food, I went to my party of 12 and apologized to them and told them I dropped the tray of their drinks and I'd be right back with a new one, still with that smile on my face. Once my shift was over, Mindy pulled me into the office and explained what I did was not okay and she was going to write me up for it, so I had to sign a document stating I understood why I was being written up and I refused to sign it before speaking with other management. There was much more discussed in this conversation, but I can narrow it all down she said I would be fired if I didn't sign the write up document at that exact moment, I still refused and said I would speak with the GM about it tomorrow morning, on my next shift. The next morning I explained to the GM what had happened and stated that I was working, while others were on their phones but Mindy singled me out. I also asked him to check the cameras to see the incident take place, and might I say, it was so satisfying to physically see myself drop everything. After lots of discussion, the GM said there's no problem here, ripped up the write-up, and told me to continue being the hard worker I am, and I never had to work with Mindy again. The end. Google it it took me two minutes. So, I was working as a part-time for this startup firm. The firm is related to hydrogen production, and I had this task of finding suppliers who would be willing to build us a prototype scale hydrogen separator from Syngas. Now, the technology needed, I will call it PHF porous hollow fibers is a very highly researched technology. And almost any string that you search, you are going to come across tons of tons of research papers on the topic. I did, of course, use a variety of tricks for efficiency and filtering results and so, managed to find some sources. It did take me more than a day or two of filtering the sites to find some reliable sources. Now, besides me, there was this other senior PhD professor who was also helping with this task. He told to my boss, there is this site, go check it. And I was given the recording of that phone to follow it up and for the love of God, I couldn't decipher the name of the firm that our PhD guy was taking. I asked my boss very nicely, what I am overhearing is this John firm. But no matter type of string I search, I cannot find something relevant to what we need. My boss eventually caved in, talked to the professor again, and got the name of it. Now, the site was Johnson Matthey, and if you are familiar with that site, it is also a scholarly review site. I had already gone through that site, and I knew there was nothing but a paper about the topic there. So, I told my boss that this is a research site, and they don't sell products like that. At most, I can find tons of catalysts on it and that is all. But my boss ensured me that he's a PhD, and he knows better and how I should just go look. I spent more than two hours on that site, and looked up every single reference to hydrogen, separator, and fibers, and eventually told my boss the same thing. That is not what the site is for. So, next day when I come to the office, my boss starts sending me telegrams jazz, and I'm screen notification reading it. Boss sends link, 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 and then, Google is free. It took me two minutes. I read that from screen notifications, rolled my eyes, gave it five minutes, and then tabbed into the links to read through. Now, unfortunately, boss edited out the message it took me two minutes, but I knew she had sent it earlier. So, I go through the links, and I kid you not, the first link was about cars, the second link was about catalysts, and the third link was about rooftop firm that uses a sort of membrane. And just like the amazing employee that I am I took the next three hours of my time taking notes on everything that was on those sites, making a report, and then telling my boss that hey, so, I spent some time on those websites that you sent me. Website A was about XYZ, 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 Web B was about, etc etc. And after my report was over, I said, I have very diligently viewed the sites that you forwarded me, but as I reported earlier, I could not find any relevance to what we are looking for. However, if you want me to further pursue it, I can write them an email to inquire too. The sources that I have found have been already verified for possessing the tech that we are looking for. Sadly, while searching takes a click, filtering the results is the real work even though boss person still made me email Johnson Matthey, and I forwarded their confused reply back to my boss, it still felt good to see how boss's two minutes worked out. Ah and boss passive aggressiveness grew lol, and I just had to quit before I sunk to the same level lol. Healthcare executive hates her own policy. This happened years ago. I am an OBGYN in a busy suburb of San Francisco. One of my patients was the vice president of a large health insurance corporation. She was a dynamic executive who climbed the corporate ladder quickly, 
One of her special talents was reducing health care benefits for patients. She initiated a policy where women who underwent cesarean section would to be discharged in two days rather than the standard four-day hospital stay. Shortly after having in vitro fertilization she found herself pregnant with twins. During one of her office visits I mentioned the new two-day policy. I told her that for some patients it was really rough to be discharged after major surgery in two days and be expected to care for a newborn infant. She just smiled and said that she didn't get where she was in corporate America by giving away my Money, and patients just needed to suck it up. Health insurance wasn't meant to be a convenience. She was 42 years old and went to full term with her twins. Despite her age she elected to attempt a vaginal delivery because of the quick recovery. Her labor was long and extremely difficult and ended with cesarean section. On day two I went to her room to complete her discharge from the hospital. She said, I'm not leaving. This is inhuman. You can't expect me to go home and take care of twins like this. I can barely walk. All you need to do is write a note in the chart that says I'm having a complication. My stay will be authorized. I told her that would be fraud. And I wouldn't be willing to falsify a medical record. Anyway, about a year later the state of California forced them to reverse the policy. HOA tried to punish us told us to stop them if we can malicious compliance cost them 16 of the annual HOA income and the cameras are still installed today. This happened several years ago and is a multi-year long story I'll keep it as succinct as possible. We installed cameras in front of our home that were looking at our vehicles. Part of the camera angles did overlook parts of two neighbors' properties one backyard and one side yard. The cameras were battery operated and had a function where you could gray out areas that you didn't want to film. When motion occurred in the grayed out areas, the cameras would not be activated to film. The neighbors' entire properties and several bushes on our property were grayed out we did this when installing them. One of the neighbors was a friend and had no issues with this whatsoever we showed her the camera angle and she said she didn't care whether or not we grayed out that area we still left it grayed out over battery life concerns. The other neighbor's name was Karen not really, but we all know why I chose that name. Karen was on the HOA board and, as you can imagine, we didn't get along with Karen or the HOA board. We told Karen about the camera and showed her the grayed out areas at the same time that we told our friendly neighbor about it. It was simply an FYI conversation we are not on friendly terms not an asking permission conversation. She told us to take the cameras down immediately or we would regret it. About a week after we hung the camera up, we got a notice from our HOA that we were violating the bylaws. The bylaw in question? A nuisance to your neighbor's bylaw. There wasn't a specific bylaw preventing placement of cameras. So this is all they could find to try to punish us. We responded with a letter detailing how we were not violating any bylaws or laws in general and asked them to cease and desist. We all know how these stories go though. They did not cease. And they did not desist. Their first response? The HOA has the right to enforce these bylaws. Try to stop us, if you think you can. These types of responses were, unfortunately, quite common from this board. We entered this battle with one goal in mind to cost them as much money and time as possible. The HOA hired a lawyer specifically to fight us. To my knowledge, this has not happened to any other residents. In the following four months we ended up costing the HOA over $4,000 in lawyers fees fighting this battle. For reference, the entire HOA income was $25,000 a year. When it came time for our official HOA hearing over the matter, we had successfully postponed it thanks to an attorney friend three separate times. There were over 100 back and forth emails with the HOA attorney and ourselves. Each one of those emails was a 15 minute expense for the HOA. And I was happy to follow up a follow up question with another follow up question if it meant the HOA attorney was going to keep billing them did I say follow up enough times? We didn't actually want to take this battle to court. So we ended up removing the cameras the day of the hearing to prevent being fined even if the fine wouldn't hold up in court. The HOA decided in the hearing that we were guilty surprise, surprise of violating the bylaw. They couldn't fine us as the bylaws don't allow a fine until after a hearing has been held and the cameras were already removed. In the end, the punishment was a sternly written piece of paper on the attorney's letterhead delivered by a certified mail that stated that we were allowed to place a camera on our home that had the potential to invade a neighbor's privacy. Keep in mind. The letter specifically stated the camera could not be placed on our home. We left the cameras off of the home for about four months until the annual HOA meeting. You should have seen the look on the HOA board's faces when I asked them to explain the $4,000 line item for attorney's fees that simply stated title searches attorney fees. The board actually tried to hide the fact that they spent $4,000 trying to fight us over a couple of cameras by putting the fees in as title searches. Needless to say, that meeting did not go well for them. About half of them lost their positions on the board. The other half including Karen, unfortunately remained on the board. About a week after the annual meeting, we installed new cameras facing the same direction as the prior cameras only this time, we installed a post in the ground and mounted the cameras to that post. The admonishment we received after the hearing specifically stated that we were not allowed to install cameras on our home and said nothing about putting them on a post. They did send a letter to try to tell us to remove the cameras. 
but a sternly worded response indicating that we were prepared to fight them actually worked this time around. I guess they didn't want to spend another $4,000 fighting us. We didn't receive any follow-up responses. And the cameras on the post are still installed to this day over two years and running strong. How I complied my way out of a parking ticket A few years ago, I parked in a paid parking lot, but forgot to buy a parking ticket. When I came back a few minutes later, I discovered an $80 ticket on my dash. While I was frustrated about my own forgetfulness, the ticket itself was fair. However, I came to discover that the amount they had charged me was not. Before leaving the lot, I noticed a small detail on the terms and conditions sign at the entrance of the lot. It said that a failure to pay for a parking ticket would result in a $70 ticket, not the $80 that I was charged. While I'm no lawyer, I do know that those signs essentially create an implicit contract upon entering the lot, therefore the company was technically violating their own contract by charging me extra. I appealed the ticket, stating that I would be happy to pay the agreed upon $70, but it was rejected. I then reached out directly to customer service, explaining the same situation. They rejected my request to pay the valid $70, because their ticket amounts are non-negotiable. Cue the malicious compliance. I realized that by their own words, they are the ones attempting to negotiate the price by charging me an extra $10, so I called up the supervisor of their claims department. She was already aware of this dispute, and immediately attempted to shut me down saying the signage is not up for discussion. I reminded her that their company's policy states that ticket amounts are non-negotiable, and that given what the terms on the sign stated, they were trying to negotiate a higher price. Once again, she shut me down stating the signage is not up to discussion. The rest of the conversation went something like this me so where can I escalate this from here? Her there is no more escalation, next stage is court. Q more malicious compliance me seems silly to go to court over $10, don't you think? Her yeah. It does. Me okay, well I'll begin the small claims court process over the non-negotiable price issue then. Her okay. I was having fun at this point, and was fully ready to start taking legal steps over this $10 on a matter of principle and knowing that if I did the company would immediately cave. Before doing that however, I sent one final email to the vice president of the company. I explained the whole dispute explaining the signage, their non-negotiable policy, and how the appeals supervisor told me my next step was to take it to court. I offered them the opportunity to resolve this civilly before going on to that stage. Not even three hours later, I got an email back, stating that my ticket had been fully cleared as a courtesy. I called their bluff, maliciously complying to the contract and the take it to court attitude, and it worked. As an added bit of pettiness, I replied thanking them, and ceased the appeals supervisor. I then directly addressed her telling her that this is how easy it could have been resolved if she would have actually addressed the signage issue. The moral of this story pushed back against parking lot companies. They use shady practices, and try to scare people into paying unjustly. Often a simple, but credible legal threat will make any issue disappear at its spelling edit to a few points as some have pointed out, yes, these parking tickets aren't usually enforceable. That being said, if I ever wanted to use this lot again which is the only one in the area then I would have to get it resolved lest I get towed. Also, I can't recall exactly how the appeals woman brought up court, but I don't think she implied that I should sue. I think it was more of a veiled we will sue you statement, which was of course a bluff. Regardless, and as many pointed out, her mentioning court at all was a bad idea on their part. I altered my uniform to comply with the dress code in my employee handbook. Back when I now a 37F was younger with a lot of attitude and a loud mouth, I worked for a nice Italian restaurant in my hometown. I didn't have a single issue with management until 7 months into my employment when a male manager joined the team. He was a bit of a misogynist. He would make backhanded comments about women, and he only had issues with the female staff. He wrote me up for some ridiculous reasons, one being opening the dock door too hard, when it was a heavy steel door that you had to put some muscle into to open. He fired another lady who was pregnant for asking to be put in a section closest to the kitchen. She filed a lawsuit and won too. One day, I walked into work. He pulled me into the office immediately and presented me with a write-up slip. It was because I was not wearing a belt. The dress code stated if pants have belt loops, a belt must be worn. Okay, my uniform that day didn't comply with the dress code. The issue was that I hadn't worn a belt in 7 months while he and the other managers never mentioned it. In my opinion, the appropriate thing to say would have been hey. I see you haven't been wearing a belt and we haven't been enforcing it. Dress code says you must wear a belt if you have belt loops. I'll give you X amount of days to purchase one before I start enforcing. I just got a straight right up. So I went home and cut off all the belt loops off all of my work pants. The next day, immediately upon walking in, he asked where my belt was. I pointed to my pants and said where are my belt loops? The employee handbook stated if there are belt loops but I no longer had belt loops. Let's just say it didn't make him like me anymore. 
but I felt like a hero standing up to him in such a petty manner. I convinced my teacher to let me leave class two hours early by doing, basically nothing. For context, I'm attending a trade school right now. The school only enrolls you in one class at a time, and each class lasts three weeks. The classes are Monday, Friday, and they're three hours long 9.30, 12.30. The last two days of each rotation are exam days, and on those days the teachers will usually let you leave as soon as you finish your exams. I'm currently just over halfway done with school and I have perfect attendance. I could leave class early without permission, but I would have to take an infraction, which would ruin my perfect attendance. So yesterday, we were doing the online final, the written final, and quiz retakes. I finished everything after about an hour, turned my papers in, and asked so am I good to go? The teacher, who will call Mr. D, said no, you need to stay until 12.30. Cue malicious compliance. I decided that instead of absent-mindedly scrolling Reddit for two fucking hours, I would mess with the teacher and hopefully make him regret keeping me there for no reason. This particular classroom is set up with two long tables for the students to sit at, with the teacher's desk at the end of one of the long tables. I went back to my seat, pulled my chair out, and faced it towards him. I sat down, folded my hands over my lap, and just stared at him. I even tried on a subtle creepy smile. I grew up with strict parents, so I knew that I could have easily kept that up for two hours if I wanted to. He glanced my way a few times. He started to look uncomfortable. After just 10 minutes, he finally said oh my god, are you done with everything? All your labs, homework, everything? Yes sir. Okay fine, goodbye, go home. Jesus. I went home and thoroughly enjoyed my victory nap. I got fired, and cost the store approximately $30,000. Cross posted from our anti-work 2008 I quit fired and they tried to get me arrested. I was working a second job at our local small grocery and butcher shop, few nights a week to pay for my kids activities. I was hired as a cashier. The person that did the end of day butcher shop cleanup sanitizing quit. So instead of hiring someone for cleanup, the owners decided that the cashiers could just do it between customers. The owner sat at their office watching TV and fucking around and when a customer came in doorbell would ring, they would buzz the phone in the butcher area for the cashier to come check them out. When I came in for my shift at 6pm and was told about the new setup, I told them no. I was not hired to clean up the butcher area, I was hired to run the register and stock shelves. The owner then said I would clean the butcher shop or I could consider myself fired and they walked away. I said fine. I grabbed my things and left. Apparently, the owner thought I had given and was in doing the cleaning. So they buzzed the butcher area when customers came in for about 2 hours before someone told them no one was coming to check them out. The store's lake we your area, cigarettes and scratchers got emptied out. It was 7.30 and I got a screaming phone call from the owner about how he was calling the police and I was going to get arrested. Yeah, right. Owner did call the police, the owner stated he wanted me arrested as an accomplice to the thefts because I had left. Cops asked me to come to the store, which I did, and I explained that the owner had fired me, so I went home and the CCTV would prove that fact. The tape was reviewed, and plain as day, the owner said I was fired. I estimate they lost about $30.00.00. I moved out and took everything. It became apparent to me last week that my roommates were trying to drive me out of the house to get one of their boyfriends in on my lease. When I told them I wanted to stay, they started staging incidents messes around the house so they could yell at me for them and it all came to a head when they called a meeting with me two days ago. One of them had to hold the other back as she screamed at me that she hated me and I was not welcome in the building. They proceeded to tell me that I contributed nothing to the house and wasted their space and that they had gotten in with the landlady and convinced her to not renew my lease in June. I told them I'd talk to the landlady and when they said they were the heads of the house I laughed and went on with my day. I spoke to the landlady and she acknowledged that they were out of hand and while she had given them the power to not renew my lease. She also said I could move out whenever and not pay for a single day I wasn't there. So, yesterday when my roommates both left to visit family they are sisters, I immediately called everyone I knew and vacated the house of everything I owned. I took the curtains, the rugs, all the cat toys and even the cat tower that I had made with my mom. I took all of their things off my shelves and other furniture and stacked them in the middle of the now nearly empty living room. I snapped pictures of everything handed the keys to the landlady and immediately fucked off. They won't be back to the house until tomorrow. I've blocked them on everything so I won't get any angry messages, but I'm sure their faces will be priceless when they come home to a half-empty house with hundreds of dollars in storage and furniture gone. So much for me not contributing anything to the house, now I actually don't. They also have to find someone else to take up the lease till boyfriend can move in when June comes around or they have to pick up my rent. Feels pretty good. Note I have updated this post, it is my newest comment. I need a doctor's note to work from home for more than two days while I have an unidentified presumably contagious illness? 
if you insist. It's a tale as old as capitalism my job which, to be fair, I freaking adore working at and am so grateful for and happy it requires a doctor's note because I've been sick and working from home for two days. Now, I haven't just had a minor cold or flu. Several days ago, I came down with the worst cold flu symptoms you can imagine, and then things started going downhill from there. It got to the point where I have now been to the ER two days in a row because of tonsillitis and excruciating pain brought on by swallowing tiny sips of water. It's not great. And despite a whole battery of swabs and tests, the doctors don't know what the underlying bacteria or virus causing these symptoms is. Obviously, there's no way in hell I want to infect my coworkers with this plague, so I told HR that I would be working from home until I'm feeling better, since my job can be done 100 remotely. They hit me back with the ever famous if you need to work from home for more than two days in a week, you'll need a doctor's note since it's against policy. My first instinct was to just go into work looking, sounding, and feeling like death warmed up. But A I don't want to infect my colleagues, and B I legitimately believe that I would pass out on my walk to work and would have to be taken to the hospital yet again. Instead, I spoke to the ER doctor from earlier this evening my second visit in as many days. I asked him how long he thought I should stay away from work work from home, and then told him I needed a note so I could stay home. He had a brief flash of vaguely furious what the fuck cross his face at the odds that my job would force someone as sick as I am to come in and risk the health of those around me then assured me he would write the note. I was thinking it would just be a basic Lulu Ginger Spice should continue to work from home until the end of the week. Nah, bro came through for me. He wrote a note saying that I should be off of work for at minimum another week, then added the piece to resistance as his last line infectious disease requires more time than two days to improve. I was taking too many liberties. I'm a bookkeeper working for a law firm, specializing in receivables and trust accounting keeping track of what money in the trust account belongs to whom and what we can do with it. We also work for a lot of insurance companies on their specialty lines, for example, if a bank makes an insurance claim because it discovered one of its clients was running a Ponzi scheme through their accounts, but insurance refuses to pay out because bank employees were involved, which is excluded by the policy, and the bank sues over this, we would represent the insurance company. Insurance companies have lots of rules for how you bill them, words you can and cannot use, activities you can and cannot bill, etc. And it's part of my job to know these guidelines and make sure our bills are compliant with them. Unfortunately, many of these insurance companies use a third-party administrator TPA to review their bills, and adjust them if not in compliance with the guidelines, and they're often wrong. This leads to appeals, which have their own requirements, that I also must know. The result of all of this is that in order to get these bills done properly, and collect as much as possible on them, it takes a lot of communication with our vendors, and lawyers, and the claims counsel at the insurer. For most of my time at this firm, I have simply reached out as needed to anyone I need to clear up billing issues, and keep the issues requiring a lawyer's attention to a minimum. Additionally, nearly all of the claims counsel have told me to reach out to them as needed for billing issues. The lawyer's value is in providing advice to our clients, not in billing minutia that I am perfectly capable of dealing with, and my job is to support them by dealing with the minutia. Or so I thought. It turns out a bunch of lawyers were unhappy with me reaching out to claims counsel whenever I needed to and not making the request to the lawyer to reach out to claims counsel for whatever I needed. Okay, fine. It's not like I don't have other work to keep me busy for the rest of time. You want to deal with this shit, you go ahead. Needless to say, the lawyers were still are completely oblivious to the amount of work my job entails I guess that's my fault for doing a good job all these people years. So far we've missed several appeal deadlines, resulting in about $25,000 in foregone revenue. There's a method for most insurers for appeals after the fact, but it doesn't really work for, we didn't email you before the deadline, would you please approve it now anyway? The managing partner asked me if we could do an appeal after the fact, he spent a week working out how to say, yeah, it's our fault, but would you please still fix it for us? There's another $25,000 in appeals due on Monday which we need claims counsel to approve, so the DPAs will process the appeal and the lawyer who has to get me the approval is away Thursday and Friday. There's another probably $50,000 in appeals on other files which are due by the end of the month. I could fix everything with a couple phone calls, but I'm not allowed to make them. Claims counsel won't reach out to me unless they need to I dropped enough hints that they understand what is happening, and are supporting my malicious compliance, so we're both watching the clock tick down. I wish I had $125,000 to toss away because I didn't want to let someone make a phone call. Manager tries to crack down on dress code, 
I respond by wearing yoga pants to work, so I 34 meters used to work at a popular convenience store really popular with a cult-like following chain years ago. I've always been a bit of a clown but very good at following rules while doing so. After working there a few years and seeing managers come and go we got in a new woman who was just miserable and really wanted to flex her authority. Shortly after she started she posted the uniform portion of the handbook in the break room and started complaining about people's attire but clearly took the biggest issue with girls wearing yoga pants. So me being the petty rule follower I am combed through the policy and noticed some things in the wording. The rule stated that yoga pants are allowed as long as the ankles flared and there was no gender designation for these articles. K malicious compliance. I and a friend went to Walmart after work and bought me a couple pairs of flared yoga pants now mind you I'm not a huge guy but I am chubby and have a big beard. I began wearing them almost every day I worked and especially if she was working. This infuriated her. I would regularly hear her protests and even saw her go to the AGM and GM. Their response was always I can't say anything he's in dress code L. This continued for a month tops before she requested a transfer, but what made it even more fun was trolling weird pervert customers. They would stand at the deli area and gawk at the young ladies working especially if they were bent over the hot food table. When I would notice this I would sidle over beside them and give the boys two butts to look at before whipping my head around and making eye contact with them. The level of disgust on their faces filled my heart with joy. Edit so, I'm new to this whole reddit thing and I don't know how to edit for an update at first but the outpouring of positivity and support has been wonderful. I do still own the yoga pants so the possibility of pics does exist. And unlike when I worked at Wawa my job is much more physical so I might fill them out better lol ps for those interested I posted other socials and might post the pics over there no attendance policy no problem my senior year of high school I took a zero period elective class school started at 8 zero period was a 7 a.m. class the teacher only taught that class and was a former lawyer and adjunct college professor he told us college won't have an attendance policy so neither will I you'll be graded in the work you complete and any work you miss won't count for or against you we were given a quiz every week and a test at the end of every six weeks apparently he expected us to follow his policy in good faith and for the most part everyone did but by the fifth six weeks baseball season was in full swing and I was tired of leaving home at 6.30 for class so I decided to test his policy. I showed up for the first week and took the weekly quiz. I got an A and I didn't come back for the rest of that six weeks period. To his credit, the teacher followed his policy. I was graded on the one quiz I aced and got an A for the entire six weeks. Though he apparently regularly asked if I was still a student. I felt bad and showed up again for the last six weeks. This was obviously not universally accurate as many colleges do have attendance policies. Edit it's fascinating how hung up people are on the teacher's idea of how college works doesn't match reality. As if him not understanding how college works after he attended in like the 50s is material to the story. Oh, so kids with behavior difficulties don't deserve Christmas? This is a few years old now, and the place I used to work has now closed good riddance to bad fucking rubbish. You PTSD dealing place so I feel comfortable enough sharing it. I used to work at a place where teenagers lived full time when they had behavior difficulties, usually drug use, alcohol abuse and or truancy. They lived there full time, and the program was staffed a full 24 hours. They required supervision at all times, except for in the bathroom, and at night, Supervision was reduced down to 15 meters checks all night long. I worked third shift at this job and I worked there for, at the time of this incident, five years, almost five and a half. I did not love my management, but I did love my kids. And for the entire five and a half years I worked there, during the Christmas holidays, the third shift staff would do the seven nights of Christmas we're in. We'd put little presents outside their doors on the week leading up to Christmas. They were pretty generic things like, body washes, lotions, soft fuzzy blankets, etc. But it made them feel a little better about being stuck in an institution during the holidays. This place also had, this is hard to explain in text, but they had statuses that they could placed on, and for ease of understanding, I'll call them bad, good, perfect. If someone was on the perfect status, they had a later bedtime, etc. Certain unwanted behaviors could knock them from a perfect status to a good one, or a good one to a bad one. This place insisted up down and sideways that the bad status was not a punishment, that the kids' behaviors had earned the bad status and as soon as they showed remorse and that they'd learned from their mistake, they could earn back good status. This is important. Well, during the year 2018, we got a new manager. We'll call them Sammy. A few days before the Christmas holiday, Sammy calls me up when I get to work and says kids who earn bad status don't get their 7 days of Christmas present until they earn off bad. And I disagreed with that super hard. She insisted it was because we're rewarding bad behavior. I insisted that the bad status wasn't a punishment and that withholding presents was a punishment, so which is it Sammy? 
Hmm? She got short with me and ended up hanging up on me. So I wrote out my end of night logs by throwing her under the bus, and stated, openly, on government legal emails, that Miss Sammy last name had stated that the ladies who had earned bad status were not allowed to get the seven days of Christmas presents that their peers were getting, and as this was a punishment, that we needed to change the legislation on our rule set. Since bad status says on its paperwork that it is not a punishment, it's a consequence earned by behaviors, we should be changing it to say that these behaviors are bad, and they earned a punishment status. I got several emails in quick succession that stated to give the presents, and then I got written up. I gave the kids the presents anyway, before the email, because fuck that. Also fuck you Sammy, you know who you are. Added Sammy did get super fired, though not after this incident. After a few others just after I quit, I now obsessively trawl our employee page at my current job to make sure she doesn't work here either lmao. Only a malicious offer. So this happened a long time ago, and only the offer of compliance was malicious. And it benefited nobody except my internal satisfaction. So I get this job at a large insurance company in their group health insurance finance department, not too long after I've graduated college with a degree in economics. I'm given one of three group receivable systems to report revenue and told figure this out. Turned out that the system was one from an old acquisition, and one the people from the old company had kind of sabotaged the reporting. Anyway. I was able to trace the mainframe data flows, figure out what wrong, and fix it. During that time the senior in my department took me under her wing and we became friends. Our supervisor then suddenly gets promoted to another division, and my friend becomes the supervisor. I assume all of her responsibilities, mainly so she can focus on management and look good. So I take all the stuff she's done with a pencil and green ledger paper and convert it to a piece of software called Symphony. That had a Lotus 123 spreadsheet, a word processor, a database and a rudimentary graphics package, and you'd bounce between them by pressing Alt F7. So anyway, my friend new boss tells me she would have made me the senior accountant, but she knows from our becoming fast friends that my academic background in accounting is light. So she's going to hire someone else, and maybe in a couple of years, etc. Naturally I'm disappointed, but more betrayed. I just done what she'd done, and way better than she did it, and off the side of my desk. Fast forward three months, my new boss asks to speak with me. She says the new senior accountant doesn't know how to use a PC. She then asked me to reverse engineer the reporting process back to Green Ledger paper. I closed my eyes for a second, then looked at her and asked, would you like me to use a crayon? PhD student sends me script to debug, then subscribes to my malicious compliance package when I over deliver. TLDR PhD student asks me to debug her code, I fix more stuff than she anticipated. Somehow this wasn't a good thing so now we get a little more maliciously compliant. After I finished my degree, I stayed around in the research group at my uni part time as a bioinformatician to support ongoing PhD projects and their bioinformatics analyzes. This mainly because the group currently lacks a senior researcher and the professor himself doesn't know anything about coding. We have a bunch of awesome PhD students but one of them has proven to be completely incapable of doing even the most basic scripting R and Python. I am not sure how she has worked on her project for three years without picking up even the most basic skills. Furthermore, she has shown a remarkable ability to completely ignore any advice from anyone and doesn't read the documentation in any packages or command line tools she uses. Instead. She exclusively relies on code snippets she finds while googling and guilt trips others into writing and debugging her code for her using puppy eyes and frequent crying. This week, she sent me a full R script with a simple request the script does some genetic analysis on a set of aligned DNA sequences and produces a plot in the end. She didn't know how to change the colors in the plot and legend anyone who has ever worked with R will know how basic this is. I look at the plot that her script produces. In addition to the colors being messed up it is immediately obvious that the results make no biological sense whatsoever. Based on this, I ended up investigating the entire script and the data that goes into it step by step. Needless to say, half of the script didn't work at all she just ignored all the error messages, labels of all samples are messed up, code snippets she copied from somewhere on so didn't do anything as she just copy pasted them and as is without understanding what they even do. Finally, the DNA alignment, which forms the basis for the entire analysis, is not properly aligned. So basically. This entire analysis is completely wrong. Given she has a committee meeting for her project next week, I decided to be nice. I invested more than 4 hours last night, debugged and rewrote the entire script, fixed the issues in her data, wrote comments with explanations for every step in the analysis, and finally render a much better plot in the end including the correct colors. After I sent it to her, she complains about me rewriting her script I didn't ask you to do this and is overall super defensive about every single correction I made and feedback I typed up. I'm confident that all the things I did find were, in fact, 
errors because now the plot suddenly makes biological sense and is consistent with our expectations. She also cried as per usual protocol, of course. Obviously she also didn't thank me for all the work I did. After a back and forth in my MS team's DMs, which lasted well over 2 hours today, I decided to simply comply with her wishes. I went back to her original script and fixed only the one line of code at the very end of the script which messed up the colors, left everything else as is and sent it to her. I told her to do with the other fully corrected and tested script as she pleases which means she won't use it because she's confident in her results. In the future, when dealing with her, I will take much greater care to only fix the issues I was specifically asked to fix. Nothing more, nothing less. Enjoy your PhD committee meeting on Monday in which you get to present your objectively incorrect plot to four professors, who will then decide if you even stay around for another year. On the plus side, she has motivated me to finally look for a decent job outside of academia. Second-hand store won't donate extra clothes because I didn't check a box on a form. There's a store in my city where you can bring your unwanted clothes to and they will sort through them, buy the ones they like off of you, and give the rest of them back. They also have an option to just drop a bag of clothes off, and you can come back and pick up the ones they don't want later, or you can just check the box to have them donate whatever is left. A few years ago I dropped a bag of clothes off and figured I'd go through what they didn't want when I picked up the money just to see if there was anything I might want to keep before it got donated. When I picked up the cash and took a quick look through the bag, I told the person behind the counter thanks so much. I don't actually want any of these so they can be donated. She told me that she couldn't donate them because I hadn't checked the donate box on the form when I dropped my clothes off. I argued that shouldn't matter since they donate clothes anyway so what's the difference? She was adamant that she would not take my clothes for donation. We went back and forth on this for a full minute or so, with both of us getting more annoyed by the other. Eventually I thought fine, I'll play your little game. I picked up the bag and said alright. Thanks so much and left the store. Five seconds later I walked back in with the exact same bag saying I have a bag of clothes to sell, and I'd just like to donate whatever you don't buy. She looked at me pissed and said fine, I'll just donate them, but next time just check the box on the sheet. I walked out of there with my money and otherwise empty handed. Tell me to go home and then shave? No problem. Hello compliant friends. Obligatory, just read a post and it reminded me of my own. Back in 2010 I moved out of my folks place to a neighboring town and got my first real job working for the Hamburger Emperor. About halfway through my 11 months day, working in only the kitchen, we had a semi-surprise manager aka Big Boss visit. It was about an hour drive so we, we informed they were on their way. This was a very small town, and on most days I would ask my roommate to drop me off or I would simply walk the 30 minute it took to get from one end of the town to the other. Little foreshadowing happening. On the day of note, I had been dropped off for my shift around noon, as I was usually scheduled for lunch rushes. After working for about 2 hours the news came in and suddenly nothing is clean or good enough. Now I've heard fast food health inspection horror stories, and I have none of my own. We kept a clean ship. Lower management here by little boss was just looking for anything and everything, and in their triggered state wasn't afraid to split hairs. And in my case, hair was their primary focus. See my adolescent hormones had the audacity of finally mustering up enough facial hair at 19 that one could reasonably call it a 5 o'clock shadow, without being completely laughed out of the room. Knowing full well my ride situation, but obviously not thinking about it, little boss requested that I go home to shave and come back. I said yes sir. And off I went on foot. After walking home for about 15 minutes I texted my roommate who promptly picked me up, I shaved. We got lunch and then we drove around another 40 minutes of me on the clock while we did dumb college kid stuff. After about 90 minutes to 2 hours, my roommate dropped me a block away and I walked back in. Little boss was pissed, flying around trying to make everything look seamless while being scrutinized by big boss. None of my peers noticed much, they're all keeping their nose down as to not be singled out and get made an example of for little boss to save face and look good. You know how these things go. With all eyes on us little boss just started laying into me, I wasn't 100 confident here or even remotely cocky, I just calmly stated it's a 30 minute walk both ways and I was prioritizing having to shave. Big boss asks little boss what's up, inquiring towards the situation at hand. Before turning away little boss mumbled something to me about how I need to be more upfront about things and can't just take off for 2 hours without telling anyone. Lol they both went into the tiny office and I never heard about it again. With the high turnover rate these places have a reputation for, there were only a couple of people left who even remembered. Big Boss is the one who got me the job. Tell us the right time. For many years, my family would take trips with other family members. All of these trips had one thing in common. Common, my aunt, uncle and cousins would be late for everything. This used to really irritate my parents who were pretty punctual and a, a lot more kids to organize four of us compared to my two cousins. By mutual agreement, 
any other family involved in these outings decided to, to go along with my parents give aunt and uncle the wrong time. For example, if an event started at 11 a.m., they'd be told 10 a.m. This was pretty effective until aunt and uncle. Uncle started realizing they were being given the wrong time. I believe other family members explained why that was in that. That they were fed up with always waiting on them or being late. Self-awareness not being very apparent that they were the issue, it was decided by them that it wasn't their fault and they told my parents give us the right time from now on and. And you'll see. We aren't the problem my parents especially my mam hates the idea of people missing out on something but is also prepared to let a natural consequence occur if it's not too harsh. The very next week we had a day trip booked on the ferry. This was something we did once a year, year, over to the UK and back in one day. Fondly known as a booze cruise back in the, the day due to the opportunity to purchase cheap alcohol. Kids would explore the ship and when we docked. Ray the pick. Pick and mix in Woolworths and buy confection that we couldn't get at home. It was something everyone looked forward to a lot what can I say. It was the early 90s with the best will in the world, the ferry waits for no man. So it was a sad day for four people who were told the. The ferry left at 8 a.m. sharp the correct time and who arrived after 8.30 to see a small, ferry-shaped speck in the distance, heading towards the UK. Sadly. It didn't make them any more punctual after that but they were always told the correct time as requested and if they were late, we didn't wait anymore. For months, whenever we'd see them after that, my parents' parents used to cheerily wave and say very nice to see you. The day I became my classmate's advocate. The school I won had a student's code which was the rules the students should follow and the consequences for failing to do so, basically in law book. So here in the Brazil it's not usual for you to have the educational parts of school life separated, like one place for high school another for kindergarten and so on, usually Terry's just one place that has it all. The school that I went had a nasty high school coordinator, she overlooked all the teachers that dealt with the high school students, and she usually used the code for her advantage. I was about 15 years old at the time and got so mad about about it that I looked for my mom's copy of the code. All parents received one at enrollment, found it and read it all, every rule and penalty, asked my mom for it and she gave it to me. From that day it never left my bag. So through the span of a year a lot of classmates got late to school, more than 15 minutes, and the penalty for that was that if you got late to class three times you would receive a written warning. Three of those got you suspended from class for a day and three suspensions got you kicked from school. Because of that, at the first day of classes next year the high school coordinator went around all the classrooms to announce that every time someone arrived late, they would receive a warning. So if you got there late nine times you were kicked out. I didn't say anything at that moment but after some months I got late to class for the third time, they took me to her office and she told me that I wouldn't be attending class that day since it was my third time late I was being suspended for the day. Enter malicious compliance, I open my bag, pull out my copy of the code and tell her that I wasn't suspended because that's not what's written in the code and when I was enrolled at the school my parents agreed to the code's rules not hers. She got really mad said my copy was outdated and that she was going to check hers. I just waited and not long after the found her copy brought it over, read it silently and her anger melted away, she became a puppy and old to go to class. Some hours after she went around all the classrooms to announce that her changes to the rules were no longer in effect and that everyone that had their suspensions revoked. The name of my son must be on the calendar? Okay, not my story but my father's. Please excuse my English, I'm not a native. Before I 31M was born, my parents had a friend. Friend who were blind and he had a very original name, a variation of an octuel name, who is, is pretty rare in the literature of my country. But, because it was very uncommon, people tended to think it was a mistake when they saw it on. On writing the actual name is very close to another name and scraped it to replace it with the legit name. Honest mistake to be fair. My parents friend was an absolute treasure and gave me his name in his honor. Honor but he advised my parents to do a little modification to it for my own sake. So my father decided to add a silent letter at the. And to make sure people don't think it was a spelling mistake. That choice took place two months before I was born. After I spawned to this world thanks mom my father came to the town hall in. In order to state that I was born that day classic procedure here and state my name. When the agent saw my name he had, had a doubt and asked if it was legal. Keep in mind that it was a very small town, pretty conservative. My dad knew, sometimes officials tends to freak out a bit with new names. Names but, as long as it's not something like Google or Kingslayer they let it down. The mayor of the town passed by and took a look on the paper and said that this name was not possible. Possible to my father and added something like if it is not on the calendar Christian name day tradition, I won't sign this paper. As I said very conservative town. My dad responded it have to be on the calendar? Fine, my, my son will be named Fate Nacional counterpart of Andathan Day or Thanksgiving. The mayor you can't do that, 
You will destroy that child life. My dad watched me. My dad proceeded to fill another paper with the name Fake National. Handed it to the mayor who, according to my dad, sighed and signed the first paper. Today, unfortunately, I don't talk to my dad anymore for various reasons. But I really like that unique name. So, thank you for that dad and thank you for, for that story you told every Christmas before we took separate ways. The unintended cost of stupid corporate travel policies. I used to fly a lot for work. My record year was more than 250,000 miles on just my favorite airline. Then the company I worked for was bought by another company with a much more restrictive actually oppressive travel policy. We could only book coach class with the new company and it couldn't be more than $100 over the cheapest airline serving a particular airport. I would usually fly out of FLL. PBI, or MCO, and only once in a blue moon MLB. With the new policy I was pretty much forced to use Southwest, Spirit, Frontier and the likes. And this is now where MLB was standing out. After the big financial crash in 2008 there was only one airline left in MLB for many years and that was Delta which happened to be my favorite airline. So instead of a $600 ticket on Delta out PBI because there was a $400 on one of the cheap airlines I followed the travel policy and booked a $1,400 coach ticket out of MLB. Our travel policy also did not allow us to book first class. When you travel on short notice however, it is quite possible that there is discounted first class still available while all the remaining coach seats are full fare. In other words the first class ticket is cheaper than the coach ticket. So I would make sure I book my flight in compliance with the corporate travel policy and then contact the airline to adjust my booking turning that expensive coach seat into a first class seat plus getting the difference in Delta dollars too bad our corporate policy required us to also book non-refundable fares lol. That is what happens when a grumpy bean counter creates a corporate travel policy. Later they wanted us to only book through Amex travel service so that Amex would enforce the policy. More than once I heard comments like I've never seen such a stupid policy, and quite often they would book a flight for me overriding the no first class when first class was less expensive or they would recommend to me to do exactly what I did in the past booking the expensive in policy flight and then deal with the airline directly to make it better. Unnecessary meetings? Here's your expensive bill. My company works with a customer that has a factory 2.5 hours away from us. We've been working with them for years now. And we've been at the factory a couple of times at the start of the project. Everyone at the customer works at that factory. We're in charge of migrating paper trail to digital documents, for a company that is like four warehouses full of paper trail documents. The solution has been working for some time. Last week, they asked us for a meeting. My boss said okay, online, whenever you want. They said that they wanted an in-person one, that we should go to the factory. My boss didn't want to, so he said if we go, I'll have to bill you for the time. They said yes. So Monday morning, my boss and the tech in charge of the process head down there. The meeting lasts exactly 15 minutes. It could have been solved in exactly two paragraphs in one email. Since they are there, tech asks the client to show them the paper trail warehouses and a tour of the factory. They happily comply. Overall, the meeting that could have been 15 minutes or two emails lasted five hours of travel plus three hours touring there plus the food. Guess who's getting billed 16 hours of work and the food for a 15 minutes meeting. DLDR customer asks for an in-person meeting that's not next easy, gets billed 100 times more time than what they expected. Added added context. Added to typo on the amount of hours billed. 